Thank you very much for the chance to be here. It's pretty amazing to sit up here and to watch the number of hands go up in this room signaling the amount of familiarity you have with wildlife species. It reminds me um, about just how fortunate you really are to live here. I have the opportunity increasingly to do a lot of things in a lot of different countries around the world in association with the World Conservation Union. And we are often trying to save even the most well-known species from brutal extirpation by a variety of forces that even with our collective energy globally, it seems we are sometimes losing the battle. So for you to be able to sit in this room and to be able to raise your hands in the numbers you did to say you have actually even seen a mountain lion, believe me, by the standards of this nation, by the standards of this continent, and by the standards of this world, you are exceptional. I recognize from looking at the basic statistics on how much land you have and how many people you have and how much wildlife you have that you do in fact live in a wildlife mecca. Not only are the species here, and many of them in good abundance, but you also have extraordinary wild beauty. And one of the things I find about all conservation debates increasingly is there seems to be less and less emphasis on wild beauty for its own sake. Yet I'll bet you anything that every person, whether they hunt and fish or whether they do not, one of the most important things they take away from their days of field is just that simple experience with wild beauty. Isn't it odd how that never seems to get up on screens or be part of what we talk about and attempt to quantify? But in the end, in the end it's really all about beauty. It's all about experiencing those things in nature that we can't recreate, that we can't make out of plastic or plasticine or whatever other commodity we want. They are produced by a natural world that is vibrant, intricate, and just extraordinarily capable of giving us beauty. It might be worth our while periodically just to ask ourselves, what a world without beauty would be like. And I can assure you that there are thousands of places and hundreds of millions, indeed billions of people who are living their entire lives in a world very much without beauty. I too come from a very special place. I come from Newfoundland. Some of you may be pondering why it is that a fellow from Newfoundland is down here in Idaho speaking to you. I don't blame you. I really don't. I don't even know why I'm here. That's not true. We actually share quite a lot. We have a place that is very wild too. The northern part of the province in which I come, known as Labrador, is one of the last remaining truly great, unimpeded, untrammeled wildernesses left on the planet, and stretches right across from there to the Canadian Arctic and literally onto the pole. I live on the island portion of the province, a place that is surrounded by extraordinary oceans that are incredibly productive and on a landscape that is renowned for its wild beauty, and I encourage you to visit the websites that deal with tourism in Newfoundland, and you will see exactly what I mean. 
But I also come from a place where the people have been embedded within a sustainable use, a utilitarian view largely of the natural world. But let us be careful about categorization that in no way suggests that they are not impressed by beauty, that in no way suggests that they don't care about the lives of animals, individual or otherwise, that in no way suggests that they do not feel deeply about the engagements they have with the natural world beyond simply a matter of getting something or taking something. In 1992, the government of Canada, and we have a, a really interesting relationship with the federal government of Canada, something you'll be able to relate to. We only joined Canada in 1949. We were an independent country up until that point. I won't belabor it, but I'm sure you can imagine the debate that that set off and still sets, uh, sets off, given that we voted to join Canada by a vote of 51 to 49. <laughs> it's a solid endorsement. <laughs> and we remember that almost every day. <laughs> Nevertheless, the fishery was closed for the northern cod, which was the greatest assemblage of life probably, or certainly one of them, the planet has ever seen. We and virtually every other European nation fished that concentration of wild creatures for 500 years, relentlessly to the full capacity of the technologies we had at any point. When we had the schooner, we pushed it as much as we could till the ice came. When we had the steam, we went further. When we had the ironclad, we went further. When we finally produced the great factory freezer trawlers, we just stayed out there night and day and took whatever we could. Not just us, the whole world. And then eventually, surprisingly, amazingly, <laughs> that population collapsed. One year alone, Last year, we took about one million metric tons of the same animal from the same population from the same piece of the Northwest Atlantic. The migrations of the barren ground caribou, the former migrations of the plains bison, the extant migrations of the wildebeest, pale in comparison. But the issue I want to remark about is the fact of what happened to our people. Because the second thing that's often missing in the conservation debate today, and we are as much to blame for it as anyone, but we collectively, in addition to beauty, wild beauty, is the issue of people. Now I happen to believe that people matter. I don't think we're a scourge. I don't think the solution to nature is to take us out of the picture. As a matter of fact, the way I see conservation, if we ever step out of the picture now, nature is doomed everywhere. So we had families in rural Newfoundland. The father would get up in the morning, 3 o'clock, and he'd go down to the wharf, and he'd get in his boat, and he'd go fish, like his father did before him, like his grandfather, his great-grandfather, his great-great-grandfather, and in some cases on back to the early part of the 1600s. The same communities, the same fish. And after the fishing was ended, he would still get up at 3 o'clock in the morning because, of course, that's what his body was trained to do. The difference was he'd stay in his house till about, oh, about 7 o'clock. And when the children got up to get ready for school, because they never saw him at the kitchen table, he would, of course, already be gone down to the wharf, but not to get his boat ready, simply to talk to his buddies, because he wasn't going to be sitting at home around the kitchen table letting his children see him not working. 
Then after the bus would come and pick them up and take them to school, and this happened across hundreds of communities in Newfoundland. After the bus would take the children to school, he'd come back into the house where he'd do a bit of work, woodwork, he'd do whatever he had to do. And then when the bus came back at 3.30 in the evening, he'd already be gone again down to the wharf so that they wouldn't see him sitting at the kitchen table when they came home. You'll never see that written up in any of the statistics either. No one will ever write about that. No one will ever pin that up on a wall, tell us it's important. But I'm here to tell you it's important. It's important to me. And I can imagine that these kinds of things are important to you. I sincerely hope they are. The lesson in this little story is no matter how important it is to you, codfish were everything to us. They made us what we are. We are the oldest non-native culture on the North American continent. Every part of our music, our humor, our language, everything was built around that animal. All the peculiar stories you hear about us, they're all true. <laughs> and they can all be traced back to God. It was one of our most important economic drivers. Every elected official knew, knew, knew that it was a critical issue in our communities and in our economy. It employed tens upon tens of thousands of people. It would be like taking the auto industry out of a major production unit in this country and doing it over and over again per capita to get any idea of what it did to our economy. And it changed the course of so many communities forever, forever. So please don't think as you put your hands up that you cannot lose what you have just because it means so much to you. But our need and our responsibility to protect these things we have is not because we might lose them. Oh, that should matter. But the reason we need to work for them is because they matter now. And because they give us something that's irreplaceable. You cannot replace the sight of a mountain lion. I know we get excited about our Harleys. I do. But it ain't the same, you know. We can get excited about our houses. We can get excited about anything. But you let that rare, wild thing cross your path. And you know it's priceless. So I am in a hovel of the wealthy right here. <laughs> because you see all these things regularly, often. And there's another reason that seems to have also gotten kind of unfashionable in today's world as to why we should look after it, because it's the right thing to do. <laughs> and I can tell you that this country, your country, your constitution, Your declaration, it was all made on, yes, an intensely de debated series of issues, but ultimately what won out was it was believed to be the right thing.
and the odds were entirely against you, as you well know. So I happen to believe in wild beauty. I happen to believe in people as part of the natural world. I don't think separating man from the natural world is at all ecological. I think it's absolutely the opposite of that. We've been predator and prey since we've been around. And I certainly don't give any chance of survival to any species if we turn it over to this myth that wildlife will exist by accident. The last rhino will have his face sawed off if we don't do something to protect them. And the sage grouse will continue to decline if we don't do something, not just us, but collectively. And the woodland caribou, which is predicted to disappear, from the planet by the end of this century will surely do that if we do not do something for it. And so will the African lion long before the end of the century. In another 25 years or so, it won't be around at all in the wild. So imagine the children of 25 to 30 years from now when they pick up a stuffed toy and it's a lion. And people will say, Oh, yeah, they used to live in Africa. At one time, as a matter of fact, they existed all around the Mediterranean, all through India. They even existed in North America. But the only place you can see them now is in a zoo. And the Boone and Crockett Club established its first set of mounted heads for exhibition early in the 20th century. Do you know why it did so? Today we think about the record books for organizations like Boone and Crockett and we think those mounts and those heads were, are part of an incentive to keep the hunting alive and to have hunters be able to recognize and be recognized for what they have pursued and taken. No. They collected these heads initially because they were convinced that these animals would no longer ever be seen by you. That is a historical fact. And if we had left wildlife unto itself at that time, they would have been absolutely right. And there would not be any elk. And there would not be any pronghorn. And there would not be any wild turkey, and there not, certainly wouldn't be any wood duck, and there certainly wouldn't be any, there wouldn't even be any Canada geese. Can you imagine that? Now, don't go saying what I know is on your mind. <laughs> That's how serious it was. Now, what we have that enables you to hold your hands up and say you saw these great creatures is not just passion. It wasn't just the commitment to do something right. We have to understand, as both a hunting and angling community and as anyone concerned for conservation, and eventually make all those people who are not concerned about conservation understand that we need systems of laws, policies, and institutions to make conservation work. Passion alone will not make it happen, ladies and gentlemen. Commitment alone will not make it happen. We have to think our way through, and we have to develop those instruments that will make it work. Funding mechanisms, regulations that restrict take to certain conditions, using science to understand what's happening in the natural world and apply it, forming agreements between countries so that migratory species are protected everywhere they go, restricting the sale of dead wildlife species so there isn't a free and open market and slaughter upon them. Those are institutions and policies, ladies and gentlemen, that are part of what we call a North American approach or a North American model. 
It is the only continental framework for conservation in the world, and it's 120 years old. And in my personal view, it is one of the greatest gifts that your nation has ever given to the world. And it's about time your citizenry knew about it, and it's about time the rest of the world did too. Now you can imagine if the people who set up those policies and institutions, as Jim mentioned last night, had not done it. But I ask you to reflect in the spirit of this meeting how ridiculous their arguments must have appeared to many. To in the 1880s say to this young country, when hardly any of you were living west of the Mississippi, when there was a tiny population on a massive continent, to actually say that we have a sense of urgency. We have to do things right now, or else we're going to lose all this. I mean, there must have been a lot of people who looked at Roosevelt and company and said, you know, you must be smoking something. <laughs> and then, of course, you had all the people who didn't want it to happen. Do we think he just waved a magic wand? No, there were big, powerful industries, wealthy consortiums. We may make analogies to today. Who did not want those rules and regulations and interferences to be created? We have to understand they worked out of a sense of urgency, not because they themselves would not still have the chance, but because we would not have the chance. Many of them, especially Roosevelt's buddies, they had enough money and stuff to do whatever they wanted anyway for their own lifetimes, but not for the nation's and not for yours. And the challenges they faced, we think we have challenges today, and we do. But think about this. This is 1885. We're all here. We're going to set up a system to save the natural resources, including the wildlife, of this country. We have no game laws virtually. We have no state agencies, no federal agencies. We have no funding mechanisms. We have no university programs. And we think we have challenges. But they did it. And we have inherited the legacy. And their achievements are in your raised hands. One unbroken line back to them. You might as well be reaching out this way to grasp their hands as this way to acknowledge that you've seen these animals. I think we do have a lot of challenges today. And I do think they're serious. We have a changing world order to begin with. Let's start at the simple stuff. We have the enormous economic challenges that the world faces everywhere, not just in this country. You will come out of this. I have absolute, total faith in that. But there will be some countries who will not. We have a massive disappearance of wildlife around the world. We have the oceans being depleted at an extraordinary pace. We have the invasives, we climate change, we can go on and on and on. But the truth of the matter is, regardless of how big the challenges are, what choice do we have, ladies and gentlemen, but to do our part? 
What are we going to do? What are we going to say? I have seen the mountain lion. I have seen the grizzly bear. I have hunted the elk on the continental divide. I have had all this. And now I will simply rest and leave it to those who come after to make their own way. Is that what we're going to do? The day that happens, ladies and gentlemen, in my reading of your history, is the day America dies. Everything you've stood for will die. And everything that those of us who have come to your country and been amazed at will die. We need to build a stronger base of support for wildlife. As the presentation earlier indicated, there are lots of people who are kind of indifferent, but maybe they're just indifferent because they've never had the opportunity. I'm not concerned about people who have different viewpoints. I think that's fantastic. I want people to say to me as a hunter, why do you do that? I want to know there are people out there who say, I can't personally understand how you can go out and take the life of a black bear in three weeks' time, or you can shoot a moose up in British Columbia in the middle of October. I, I want people to say that to me. I want people who ask me to explain to them how it is I can do that, and how it has made me who I am, and how it has made me do the things I do for wildlife. I want them to ask me that. And I want them to ask me, am I doing it humanely? I'm not afraid of people who have different viewpoints. I've speak, spoken before audiences where most of the people were anti-hunting. But what I am desperately concerned about is the people who don't care at all. I'd much sooner have a world filled with people who are so vitally concerned with wildlife that they fight all the time about it than a world in which nobody gives a damn. I know you're a very proud people and you're very proud of your state. And I know what that means. But I also know you're Americans. And I know what that means. Now, your country has been recognized for giving extraordinary things to the world. The issues of democracy and freedom under the law, freedom of speech, freedom of association, pursuit of liberty and happiness. These ideals have now been adopted, copied, or at the same time being strived for by every single nation in the world that is viewed as progressive and civilized. Everyone without exception. We've gone through the big experiments of the dictators and the alternative ideas that for a little while drove at least one large nation to a high point, but then saw it collapse. But across the world, around the world, everywhere, this is what people want. And it did not come cheaply to you. And the world might remember that in the last two great wars, except for you entered, the world would be a different place. They also ought to remember that the European Union really arose out of the ruins of a destroyed Europe that was rebuilt by the money from this country. Those are historical facts that only the ignorant will not accept. And while I recognize those things, 
and your extraordinary, extraordinary achievement in coming out of the ferocity, the brutality, the gore of that great uncivil war, always seemed a strange name to me, civil war, that you could come out of that and for all extents and purposes have put it behind you, makes you a nation of one in the world. There is not another example of that in the world. But I do believe that this idea, you know, we started painting the cave walls of Europe 50,000 years ago. We started agriculture in the hilly flanks, the area around the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, about 10,000 years ago. We came through the, Renaissance, the Dark Ages, the Renaissance, the Industrial Revolution, all of those things that happened. We saw the birth of this country. We saw all of that change. But it took us until the 19th century to figure out that human progress would not be measured by how far we removed ourselves from nature, but whether we could find a way to live within it. The whole drive of agriculture and industrialization was to give us freedom from it. And then finally a group of American geniuses, that's what they were, rose up and said, hey, no. Despite we're a small and young nation and have a massive country and it seems the world is our, like salad bowl, we're going to invent this idea that real progress is based on living with nature. This was an absolutely phenomenal idea. And it came out of your country. In my personal view, it was the last act of American genius. Not that I don't believe you have done great things or hopefully will in the future, but it lines up with democracy and freedom under the law and the right of every person to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. It falls under the same guise of having all citizens treated equally giving them access to education and health. It's not some sideshow, like half of the publics around the world treat it as. But believe me, before this century is halfway through, there will not be a human being on this planet who will not understand the significance of that idea of conservation of natural resources. Not one. And you gave that to the world. And when you built it, it was an inclusive model. This is an extraordinarily important thing for all of us to understand. When Roosevelt and Grinnell and others wished to stop the slaughter of shorebirds for their feathers, for the fashion industry, primarily to adorn hats. They didn't just appeal to individuals who had hunted and angled and said this is wrong because it's wasteful destruction. They reached out to the women's movement, fighting for the right to vote. They reached out to naturalists of all kinds, the wealthy and the not so wealthy. The wealthy ladies who had their salons where the, where the great intelligences came to debate and discuss on Sunday afternoons, as well as to the small places in rural communities where those places where those birds nested were. He didn't think Muir was a bimbo, and Muir didn't think he was. Well, Muir said to him, uh, Mr. President, when are you going to grow up, you know, and give up your guns? But Teddy took that as, well, that's, you know, that's Muir, boy. You know, you've got to tolerate Muir. They, they were friends. They were colleagues. This man who was your president, you know, he burst into the cabinet room. They're expecting him to announce some great conflict around the world. And his announcement was that a particular warbler had just come back, the first one he'd seen that spring. 
Did anybody look at him and say, Teddy, you know, you're getting soft? No, over time, over time we destroyed that. Over time it became fashionable to destroy that, to break that unity. Because as individual organizations arose, it made sense for their own hegemony and autonomy. We need all citizens to care. We need all citizens to believe. We need all citizens to engage. And we need to again make it understood that to be concerned for conservation is an act of citizenship. We always celebrate all the things that Teddy Roosevelt did. Maybe we ought to ask ourselves the hanging question. Why when so many people thought he was a cowboy or a madman or whatever else, why when he left office didn't they change it? He was only there for a handful of years. Why, when he moved on, did they not say, great, he's out, let's get rid of all that stuff? Could they have done it? Of course they could have done it. That's the question the American people must ask themselves. Be astounded at what he did, but ask yourself why did those who came after not undo what he did? And the reason in my mind is because he tied conservation to the idea of being an American. He said it over and over and over and over again. And it is the only hope that I see for conservation in this world. We can argue to people about ecosystem services. I can argue to people about wild beauty. I can make any of the arguments I wish to make. But they must everywhere see it as a part of their responsibility as citizens. Just as your nation wants a strong country in other ways, it must want a strong country on the conservation front. And we cannot assume that that will come from the top. You know your history. Where did the great achievements come from? They came from the ground. I believe this is true of every nation in the world. If we do not make the people of South Africa, the people of Canada, the people of Turkey, the people of Ireland, if we do not make them understand that caring for the wild resources of their country is a part of their national responsibility, we have little hope. And the North American approach that Theodore Roosevelt led and was joined by Prime Minister Sir Wilfrid Laurier in Canada made it exactly that. And that is why nobody dared tear it down. as young as it was, as new as it was, it mattered to the American people. And we need to forge a conservation necklace, in my personal view, a necklace that brings together as many groups in society as we possibly can. We need to make them aware of the history the contributions that the sustainable use, the hunting and angling public have made in this country and on this continent for the last nearly 100 years. We need to make them understand that we have enough experiments to know that simply setting aside a few special places will not keep wildlife with us anywhere in the world. We have to make them understand that there has to be an inclusive use of wildlife, inclusive for sustainable purposes and inclusive for the pure enjoyment of seeing that wild beauty. And I am firmly convinced we can do it without ever surrendering what we feel is critical to our own views and philosophies. Some people say this is just idealism. 
The world is moved by idealism. We did away with child labor because of idealism. You created a nation, the greatest nation in the world, the most influential nation the world has ever seen, out of idealism. Ragtag bunch going up against the greatest army, the greatest navy. You didn't even have a navy, a few riverboats. Be like Newfoundland going to fight, you know, Britain or something. But you succeeded, didn't you? And we surely can succeed in this. I've done a lot of work with wildlife, and I've seen a lot of really special things. I haven't seen a mountain lion, so I hate all of you who put your hands up. <laughs> Just want to make that clear. Uh, but. I did a lot of work on seabirds long before I moved to studying moose and caribou and bears and now lynx and coyotes and that kind of work. And I can tell you, if you've never been to a major seabird colony off in, that sits in the middle of the ocean, you really are missing something because it is a world of constant birth and death. It's the most intense natural experience you can ever encounter. I worked for a long time on a, a black and white seabird called a tur. We call it a tur in Newfoundland. Others call it guillemots. Nest on very sheer cliffs, high above the ocean. Doesn't build any nests, lays a single pointed egg on rock ledges. The egg spins when it's hit because it's so tapered rather than rolls off the ledge, which is a good thing. And after about three weeks of age, those eggs break open in a little small black and white bundle of hair feathers comes out, great big black feet and a black beak, hair stuck all out, all over, it's hardly recognizable as an animal, it looks like a toy. Anyway, they stay on that one little piece of narrow ledge, no wider than this, and I know because I used to go down on ropes and walk along them, so it's no wider than this. And they stand there and they get fed for about three to four weeks. The parents go to sea, one parent stays with the little bird. And we're talking colonies of tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands, constantly fighting, jabbing, pooping, you know, regurgitating fish. It's a very uh, odorous place. And um, the adult bird comes back with a single fish in its mouth with the head of the fish buried in its gullet so that the hard cartilaginous head is digested. And then it feeds that full fish to the little chick, which takes it. It sticks it in its mouth, and most of the fish is still sticking out, but it gradually digests the fish and grows happily on the ledge. It's extraordinary to see. These are wild places, windy, wet, rain-driven, fog-driven. You get a couple of sunny days a year, usually in March. But uh, anyway, it's, uh, they're wild places. These little birds grow up on that ledge. They move over a piece of ground about this big. It's the only world they've ever seen. Then. I've seen the bear haul the caribou down. I've seen the wolves chase. I've seen the fights of bears. I've seen the caribou break one another's necks. So I've seen some fairly intense things very close up with wildlife. But of an evening, after about three and a half to four weeks of age, something changes in these colonies. Around dusk, all of a sudden, there's an explosion of aggression. Birds are hitting one another, opening their mouths, growling, jabbing. There's a great deal of, of forced copulation going on on the ledges, birds flying in and pinning females to the walls. And it's, it's, it's a crazy, crazy, crazily intense thing that has changed the whole pattern of all that spring from late March right on to mid-July. And all of a sudden, the chicks start to move. They've never moved anywhere, and all of a sudden, they get agitated. They start to bow, weave, call. And the adults fly down off the ledges and swim back and forth in the thunderous breaking gray surf. In the near dark, they swim back and forth. They throw their heads back over their shoulders and open up their orange mouths and call constantly. 
By now the gulls, who were smarter than we, knew what was happening, and they would come in and be circling just above the wave tops, waiting. And finally, these little birds that I had weighed and measured and watched and loved would go to the edge of the ledge, and they'd look down, oh, and they'd retreat. 1,000 feet, you know, 2,000 feet, in some cases 10,000 feet. Look down. But then they jump. They'd hold out those great big black feet. They can't fly. They have no power of flight. And they beat these little stubby wings like mad, as you would falling 10,000, you know what I mean? <laughs> and they beat themselves, you know, like this, and they get down on the bottom. And they fall into the ocean, the waves wash them up the side, they pop up, they get sucked down again, and then eventually you see them going out to sea with one parent. And by the way, we now know that it's usually the male. Just I want to make that point, guys. You know, just get it, you know. uh, out to sea with the male, and they will not come back to land again for five years. They will not touch land again for five years, and they'll come back, and this cycle will be repeated. That cycle of continuance and progress cannot happen if those little birds don't make the leap of faith. They can stay on that ledge and survive for a while, but they will perish, and that cycle will be broken. You are in the process of leading in this dialogue, an undertaking that is already grabbing hold in this country and in Canada and around the world. Do not think that you are alone in suddenly understanding the value of having dialogue. There are changes afoot, ladies and gentlemen, and we need to be out in front of it. And those principles we believe in those principles of sustainable use, the value for those of us who hunt and fish to be able to show what it has done to make us the people concerned for wildlife that we are, and for those who don't hunt and fish and who may never wish to and who even may not care for it or be opposed to it but who love wildlife, we have to understand that they too must have their say. And collectively, we must bring those people who don't care to understand how important conservation is. We have to make them suddenly realize, you know what? Conservation matters, and that if I am to be a citizen of this state, if I am to be a citizen of this country, then I must show that it matters to me. I will be speaking about this around this country, and I speak a lot. Can you imagine that? People keep getting me back, you know? I will be. And I will be speaking about it in Korea in two and a half weeks' time at the International Congress for Wildlife Conservation, hosted for the United Nations. You're doing important things here. There will be differences of opinion, and there will be some fear and some concern all of that is, all of that is, it's impossible for it not to be that way. But look to your own history and your own achievements. As I tell you right now, this state and your agency, you're out in front. Stay there. Thank you.